a suit and tie and get your hair cut way up high. Get yourself a lawyer, son. You're gonna need a real good one. All the good lawyers, all the time here on ABC Radio Melbourne Mornings because Mr David Whiting has taken a day off and look, he's earned it. He works really, really hard whenever he comes here and talks to you. So we got one in off the bench and we got a real good one. You know her as someone who's been wrapping, wrapping you up in intelligence and analysis and kindness for many, many years here on this program. Did you know that she's really a lawyer? Her name is Liberty Sanger. She's the National Head of the Personal Injuries Law Division at Morris Blackburn, also a member of the Law Institute of Victoria's Accredited Specialist in Personal Injuries Law. And Liberty Sanger, good morning. Hi, Virginia. Liberty is here to take your calls and to offer you legal advice on matters, any matters related to the workplace. Personal injuries law, injuries in the workplace, bullying, harassment, HR problems, workplace problems of any kind. And if you wanted to actually talk to her about other stuff too, well, you know, she's going to give that a real crack too. Liberty, you've got the lot, haven't you? I do. That's quite a big pitch, but... um, (laughs) It is a big pitch. You know, this is what we do as lawyers. Uh, As people know from talking to David, people ask you all sorts of questions. They do. And often it's about... Believe it or not, it's about applying common sense. But there are legal frameworks that we work our way through Uh, to get to the end. Hold that. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Applying the law is about common sense. Well, Do do I look like I just came down in the last shower? You would be surprised. In fact, you wouldn't be surprised. You've been talking to David for a long time. Yes. How few matters it makes sense to take into a courtroom Mm. and how few matters it makes sense to engage a lawyer. But often what you need is a circuit breaker. You need someone to mediate between the parties. Mm. And we're very fortunate here in Australia and particularly here in Victoria. We have lots of agencies that will provide that service to us. We invest in that with our taxes so that we've got ombudsmen and we've got yes. um, commissions and the like that will provide that service. So uh, so often you can get that without paying money. Um, but where you need to take it further, you will need to get a lawyer. It's something that I've turned my mind to recently when I had another crack at updating a book I wrote some time ago. And it was really disheartening to hear that when it came to workplace conflict, bullying, sexual harassment, discrimination and the like, and we're not just talking about that today. It's any aspect of workplace law or indeed personal injury law. You're most welcome to call in and please do, 1300 222 774. But when it came to taking your problems to HR, this was the phrase that I was told over and over again, HR is not your friend. This is a really big topic and an interesting topic. It's true, isn't it? HR's not your friend. Well, it's it's not true, but it can be true. Um, That's so, a dreadful answer. Well, because there are plenty of good people in HR, so I don't want to discredit that profession. Uh-huh. However, when it comes to an issue like sexual harassment, I don't think our workplaces have dealt with it at all well. And often, Let, let's broaden that out and make, just make it bullying as well, not just yeah. sexual harassment, because half the audience will think, "Oh, well, that doesn't concern me." But bullying or being mistreated in your workplace, or thinking you get a rough deal, being treated badly, disrespected by your boss, asked to work, yeah. uh, unfair conditions, and the like, go to HR. You're not going to get much joy. There is no getting around that HR is employed by the employer. And the employer's interests Ta-da. are going to be paramount. Yeah. There is just no getting around that. They're there that. to protect their interests. And um, we made the point at the beginning of the program we're here as a lawyer. I'm a lawyer from a law firm that provides access to justice. I'm always going to advise people that this is why they need someone independent on their side. I would always encourage people to be a member of a union. And if they're not in a union, they certainly might need legal representation to assist them through that. Um But the broader point is how do we make sure in our workplaces we are all acting and behaving in a way that is respectful uh, so that we don't need to call on HR at those moments of crisis? In my experience, people only go to HR when things are really, really bad. Uh, And I'm sure you discovered this all over again when you were writing your book. I I did, but but also when things are really badly handled. That's when it ends up either going to HR or not going to HR because, you know, things have got too out of hand. But because they've been badly handled in the first place, someone goes to someone and says, hey, that was unfair, I don't like that. And what do you get? Defensiveness, lying, covering up, 
aggression rather than the just the human response of, oh, mate, I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I didn't mean that, hey, how can we fix this? We just don't seem to be brave enough in the workplace to be able to do that. And I would say over my 20, what is it, 22 years as a lawyer, th- that issue is at the heart of so much hurt, grief and and extra compounded injury. The lack of the simple initial Correct. apology. Correct. Uh, because people feel like their experience is diminished, devalued. They feel like their loyal years of service are yeah. not going rewarded and, and recognised. Uh, and that of itself causes harm. The, the, the very smart, capable uh, leaders understand this and will get on the front foot and make sure that they uh, provide that apology uh, at an early point. But there are so few who understand that that is in fact the best way to respond. They default to an old style of uh, legal, which is to defend, um, uh, minimise, prevent. Never admit liability. And never admit liability. That's because uh, you guys, dear Liberty, (laughs) are in the ears of the bosses saying, oh, you got a liability here, never admit, never apologise, then we're going to get a claim for compensation because you just admitted liability by apologising. Yeah, and it's become, uh, I would suggest, a habit in our profession and one that is worthy of uh, disruption because I've had workers sign what's called a release, which is just the, the document which evidences the agreement at the end of a claim. I've had workers sign those for many, many years, and uh, it is a common term in those releases that uh, the defendant does not admit liability. Mm. It's sort of as casual almost as breathing in and breathing out, uh, but it's you know it's given there as, as supposed to be a carrot to encourage workers to take a settlement or, or the plaintiff to take a settlement. Uh, but in fact, I think it's quite meaningless, and I think that all of the current understanding about how you repair harm, Mm. um, particularly mental harm to a person, would be that you should make that admission. Um, It does bring us to this this issue of the uh, non-disclosure agreements that are are quite prevalent in sexual harassment cases. Let's get to those, but some calls are coming in for you. Liberty Sanger is with you this morning. David Whiting is taking a day off. So I know that she's a familiar voice to you and also a well-known lawyer working in workplace law, personal injury law and the like. You're welcome to call in, 1300 222 774. I think it's Sumit in uh, Truganina. Is it Sumit? Good morning. Good morning, Virginia. Good morning, Doctor. Yeah, and uh, not oh. not doctor. It's Liberty. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> she's not. She's not a doctor. I assume it. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just feeling it, that trauma. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, last year, I got injured on a workplace. I work in a warehouse on a casual base. Yes. And my foot got crushed between the pallet. Oh, no good. Yeah, and uh, like since then, I've been recovering. So like 99 percent, I've been recovered. Yep. But after the MRI report and the specialist doctor with the foot care. Yep. He found out that there is a crack on my uh, right foot toe joint. Right. So now I cannot bend my toe completely. Yep. So I am just need uh, advice, like, should I hire a lawyer and uh, get a compensation? Have you put, you've put in your work cover claim. You've obviously reported the injury uh, to your employer and, and made your your first work cover claim for your weekly payments and medical expenses. Yes, but uh, I've been hired on casual basis. So now I, I'm, like, jobless. And I'm staying home and they're not giving me anything. But you would still be receiving your weekly payments and medical expenses? No. You're not? Not. Okay, you should be. Yes, you do need to seek legal advice. Um, Mm -hmm. You should have received a decision from your work cover insurer at some point that told you that you were entitled to or not entitled to weekly payments. Uh, Is, isn't the employer obliged to immediately report this to work cover? Yes, they are. Um, and uh, and there is a work cover insurer that mm. sits behind work cover that will deal with the weekly payments and the medical expenses. The fact you were casual does not disentitle you to weekly payments though, Sumit. So I would like to see you um, challenge that. Uh, and you can take that further. It also sounds like you might have a permanent disability uh, to your yeah. right foot. Yeah. yeah, that's what my specialist doctor said, that you probably won't be bent this door for your lifetime. Yeah, and um, what kind of work, have you always done work in warehouses or have you done other types of work? Uh, other types of work, but I recently started like the warehouse from the uh, recruitment agency. Okay. Well, there's another couple of claims that you should investigate. Uh, One will be for what's called a no-fault lump sum. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's based on an assessment of your impairment. Mm-hmm. Um, and you will probably be entitled to that from the, uh, the limited amount of information you've given me. Mm-hmm. And there may also be subject to the circumstances of your injury occurring, um, mm-hmm. what's called a common law claim where you mm-hmm. can claim uh, money for your loss of income and for mm-hmm. your pain and suffering. There's a lot of detail in that, um, and I don't know that we'll get time to go through all of that right now. Mm. Mm. Um, it is important that you get onto this, though. One of the things I always encourage people to do is to get timely advice. You're mm. well within time, uh, so you don't have anything immediately to worry about, mm. but it's good to get advice early on so that you know what you need to do. You've got six years in the state of Victoria to pursue a, what's called a common law claim. Yeah. Um, so I would get on and get that advice ASAP. Is there a lawyer available if Sumit doesn't have a lot of cash for a lawyer? Yes. Uh, so no, not, should, not go, advertising here, but no, no, about the should, services you can go to. You should go to the Law Institute to get a referral to uh, an accredited specialist in personal injury law, Sumit. Mm-hmm. And you'll find that um, most of the, in fact, in fact, all of the accredited law specialists will work on what's called a no win, no fee basis. Uh, Sumit, okay. good, good, good luck to you. And I, and I hope you do manage to get that lump sum. There are comments coming in about, you know, plaintiff lawyers and no win, no fee lawyers like yourself. Uh, liberty and you're sometimes described as ambulance chasers because of that kind of work. How would you defend yourself? Uh, well, I often think that the people who dole that term out are people who don't want workers and others to pursue their rights. And um, and it does bring me to a, another point about the, the stigma that a lot of people can feel in putting in a claim or making a claim. Uh, there's a great apprehension amongst the public at large about pursuing a, a claim because they have to come to admit a lot of things about their injury and the impact it's had on them. Mm. And it's just another way, I think, that language to try and stop people from pursuing their claim. Uh, what you don't want to see, and, um, and perhaps what underlies the comment made by the uh, texter, is you don't want to see lawyers that are just pursuing any old claim. Um, and I have to say, you really don't see that. That's more in the, the adverse reputation that's perhaps unfairly uh, levelled at our profession rather than what actually goes on. There's, um, oh, you're big enough to take it, I think. We are big enough to take it, and I, I certainly don't mind um, t- d- defending it. But um, you know, there, there are a lot of um, gateways that people have to get through before they're able to pursue a claim in the court. And we, as lawyers, have to uh, we have got professional obligations to the court as yep. well as having to sign certification that there's a proper basis for bringing the claim. So there's a lot of safeguards in the system to make sure that you don't bring silly claims. Sally's called in from the Yarra Junction. Hi, Sally. Good morning, Virginia. Good morning, Liberty. Go ahead. Um, hi. I have just have a question. Um, volunteer organisations, um, what sort of, um, or perhaps you can give me some information about if somebody is bullied in a volunteer organisation, um, what sort of uh, recourse could they have? Would it be very similar to the workplace? Uh, yes, they can look at um, they can look at the uh, bullying legislation. It, it, that we, there'd be an issue about whether you were categorised as a worker, and whether or not uh, the Fair Work Commission had jurisdiction over you. I might just need to go back and see whether there's any carve out for volunteers in the Fair Work Act. Um, you could certainly also look at um, at whether there was. Uh, any sort of claim for medical expenses you could make. Um, but again, I'd have to go back and just double check under the Workplace Injury Rehabilitation Act on that one. Um, right. What What is the particular issue that's going on? Um, well, it's um, someone in a leadership role that has um, bullied, verbally bullied, um, on a couple of occasions. And, and I just want know whether that, that anything could be done about that. Well, let's, if, no uh, one, if no one's willing to sit yeah. down and talk about it. Shall we take that one on notice and you can let us know? I think so. I'm just also wondering whether the Equal Opportunity Commission might be able to help, but it doesn't sound like it's... Yeah. Uh, what's the... When we dig a little deeper, um, and we don't need to do that on air, when you dig a little deeper, there might be an attribute there that you're able to... Uh, get the attention of the Equal Opportunity Commission yeah. to have a look at that, and that might be the best way through that one. Alice in Campwell, good morning to you. Oh, hi, ladies. Go ahead, hi, Alice. Hi. Um, yes, I'm just wondering, um, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for a long time, and I've worked um, oh, well, in nursing, and I'm just wondering, I have a chronic back injury or just a situation going on where I'm now having to have expensive 
treatments done um, to relieve pain and things like that. Um, it's not uh, it's a situation that is unable to be reversed, this uh, back injury. So, But there's been no particular incident. So I'm wondering where I stand with that, um, as in, you know, lifting a patient and suddenly your back went, that type of thing. There's none of that. It's just an ongoing chronic thing. Oh, that's a great question and one that I've had many times as a lawyer. Have you put in a work cover claim? No, I have not. Okay. All right. Um, so the first thing you need to do, let me go back to basics. If you have an aggravation, acceleration or deterioration of a pre-existing injury, illness or disease as a result of work, then that is compensable. So um, it may be that uh, that this has come on gradually uh, only because of work or it may be that you've aggravated a pre-existing injury and either way it is compensable. You should be uh, reporting that injury to your employer and entering it in the injury report book and making a work cover claim. Have you spoken to your medical practitioners about this and about the connection that you believe it has to work? Uh no, I haven't. I've just someone in my family sort of urged me to to uh, pursue it, and I was reluctant to because I just think, well, how how on earth do I prove that it's work that's done it? Um, well, but as they know because I've had to reduce my days of work and all that sort of thing because I just couldn't cope with the the workload. So, so um, why why do you say it's connected to work? Uh, well, just the nature of our work. Like I work in a department where we're still having to manually lift up. Um, patient their heads up in bed we don't have like electric beds where they you know the heads come up and yep. we're having to do it manually just just the nature of the work I suppose well that's I'll they, be... they do provide manual handling mm. courses and everything but there's you know it's unavoidable pretty much um well, it's always avoidable, but we'll come back to that. Um, my yeah. strong suggestion is that you go and talk to your medical practitioners ASAP about uh, what's happened and the kind of work you're doing and ask their opinion on whether it's likely that that's been uh, the cause of your increasing pain. If it is, you need to get um, a work cover certificate off them if you need time off work. If you're just claiming medical expenses, you won't need that. But then you need to report your injury, as I said, to your employer. Um, it'll ask you for a date of injury, but you can you can just nominate that it's happened gradually over time, and then you need yep. to put in your work cover claim. Um, you made a point about it's it's unavoidable. This is a this is a point that I really press with anyone in the caring professions, anyone who has to um, work with people. I find that those workers are by nature um, very caring, empathetic people, and are loath to um, put themselves and their health ahead of their patient, which is yes. very, very commendable. <laughs> mm. but, but if you were to think about if you were in a factory environment or a warehouse and you were being asked to manoeuvre 80 plus kilo unpredictable yes. waste on a regular <laughs> basis, you just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, mm. And the truth is, as, as you have um, already said in your answer, there are ways that your employer could provide you with machinery that would assist with these lifts and the like. Um, just the cost of doing business involves doing it safely. So yes. don't let that be the reason that you do not proceed with a, a claim. You should go and get some further medical advice and then it sounds like you should be putting in a work cover claim to me. Alice, good luck. Thank you very much. Good to hear from you. Thanks so much. Stephen in Melbourne has a question which is um, extremely current today. Hi, Stephen. Hi, how are you going? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. No worries. Um, look, uh, my work brings me in, in contact with uh, all members of the community. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a travelling repairman, and um, if I, I, I work uh, as many do these days uh, for an agency, and uh, what sort of um, coverage have I got in in, in terms of uh, if I if I do happen to uh, end up with with COVID nineteen, yep, uh, and I'm I'm laid off work. Well, obviously, as an agency uh, worker, um, I don't get paid. So you're an employee of an agency. I am. Okay. Um, so, a couple of things. Um, firstly, uh, if you are if you are asked to self isolate then you'll have the ordinary entitlements that any worker will have. Um, so by right, we've got access to sick leave and we can talk to our employers about using any other accrued entitlements. Um, as a 
as a kind of a sidebar here and using my practical head, uh, I think we're going to hear a lot more about what the government might provide uh, for workers in this situation as, as well as to employers. And um, I would also encourage employers to take a common sense approach because we are going to find that there are workers who either don't have any sick leave left um, or are not able for whatever other reason to access accrued entitlements. But as of right, that, that's what you can access. Um, oh, uh, yeah, sorry? No, that, that, that's interesting um, because uh, yes. uh, to my understanding, as to our work granted, the, 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 the one that I work under, um, we have no entitlement to sick leave. You were an employee though. <laughs> I, I, I am I am a uh, I am an employee. I don't want to say what company it's with. Um, it's public space, um, uh, but uh, I'm, I worked on contract for a third a third party. Well, I would encourage you to go back and check your uh, EBA or award or contract for the entitlement around sick leave. If you've got some questions about that, you can always get in touch with the Fair Work Commission. If you're a member of a union, you get in touch with your union uh, to find out what you're entitled to. And I would stay tuned about what uh, what compensation the federal government may be willing to offer. It, it sounds like there's a lot of discussion going on between unions and employers with the government at the moment. You are not going to be the only person in this situation. And the challenge, as we heard from Sally McManus on the weekend, is how are workers supposed to stay home yeah. from work if they're not going to get paid? Uh, they're going to have to pay the bills. So someone is going to have to pick up the tab e somewhere. Exactly right. You've got the Prime Minister talking to businesses wanting them to be, this is the phrase he used, generous about that. But that's where you need entitlements. So no one actually has to make the decision about whether they're being, or the assessment about whether they're being generous or not. Lots of comments on text. Morning, Virginia and Liberty. Perhaps just note that insurance contracts usually prevent admission of liability to any extent. If you do, the insurer will often deny coverage. And that's obviously very difficult, says Richard. And this on text, oh my God, this is exactly what I've just gone through, which is taking a matter to HR and getting knocked back. Went to head office HR, a total brush off. I'm now in spiralling depression. Let's get a, a quick advice if we can for our Anne, who's in Rye. Hello, Anne. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks. Go ahead. Um, my husband's been through the work cover uh, process, as we call it. Um, yes. He went to the psychiatrist and psychologist because it was a mental thing. Um, he got denied on payment of wages, but they pay for his medicine and a psychologist, but they won't pay for a psychiatrist. And I wonder how one thing gets knocked back and other things don't. So I'm with the insurance company now, and I'm, I went through an appeal. You know, I, I obviously don't know what I'm doing, but... They've admitted liability on some counts, but not on others. Well, um, I won't try and get into the mind of an insurer, but uh, often what happens is that they base it on medical evidence. So presumably when your husband uh, put forward his claim, he had either a GP or a psychologist or a psychiatrist report saying he needed particular treatment. Um, the insurer probably had a different report from their own expert and then... Uh, Some of these people are followed by private detectives. And we should talk about that, but yes, that is right. And um, there's often complaints about uh, the way that workers are treated by some of the independent yeah. doctors and and those complaints are very valid and they, they need to be investigated and I believe WorkSafe is taking those complaints very seriously. Um, but, and you can always dispute an, a decision of an insurer. So uh, this is another big piece of advice I give to all workers is that you mustn't just accept a decision of the insurer. If you think that you need a particular entitlement, there's a free disputation process. It's called the accident compensation conciliation process. You can't have a lawyer there, but you can have uh, an organisation called Work Cover Assist there or Union Assist there if you're a member of a union, or you can have a union representative there. And that's where you sit down with the insurer and you try and resolve that matter. If it can't be resolved, then it can be taken to court and that's where you will need to get legal advice. Um, but if your husband's not getting wages and he's been restricted in the amount of medical treatment he can have and you think that he does need further medical treatment at a minimum, he should be getting uh, some advice about that. Okay. Well, I find it strange because 
like it's four years worth of medicine, four years worth of doctors, like everything else gets paid for, but not his wage. I just find that I don't understand how it works. Has Have you been to see a lawyer about this? Trying to, yeah. Okay, to. We'll, we'll persist with that. And as I yep. said, go back to the Law Institute for a referral to a, a, an accredited specialist near you to get that expert advice. Liberty, great to have you on board. So many calls for you. I'm sorry we can get, couldn't get through all of them, but there you go. A lot of problems out there in the workplace. There are. Thanks, As Virginia. I guess you know. I Always do. good to see you. Liberty Sanger there uh, joining you from Morris Blackburn.